Hey everybody, welcome to Life is Beautiful. I'm Anthony. Today, we're gonna to be doing something a little bit different than what we normally do on this channel. Uh, typically, we talk about beer and beer history. However, uh, I wanna talk about something a little bit stronger today. The Dutch Yenever. It goes by many names, and I am probably mispronouncing myself. I've heard Geneva, I have heard Yenever, I, I have heard uh, Ginever. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different ways, but to get to the point, sometimes it is referred to as Dutch gin because it is a juniper infused liquor. So I wanna talk about Yeneva because it is just absolutely amazing, insanely delicious, and it has a incredibly interesting backstory, history to it that I don't think a lot of people know about. In fact, I don't think a whole lot of people outside of the Dutch know uh, about Yeneva as it is. Um, but also you'll find if you stick around to the end, we are gonna tie it back into beer. So join me on this adventure. So as I mentioned, Yeneva is sometimes called Dutch gin because as I mentioned, it is a juniper and botanicals infused spirit. In fact, the word Yeneva is actually Dutch for juniper. But I really don't think it's fair to call Yeneva the Dutch gin. I mean, uh, for first things first, uh, they're two completely separate types of liquors. They might share a common core, but they are different. And in fact, Yeneva came first. So if anything, gin is the English Yeneva. Secondly, I really just don't think you can mix them up like that. Like in a side-by-side -side tasting, you will know which one is the Yeneva, where gin is usually just an ultra nose cannon of botanicals and insane juniper flavors and aromas. Yeneva is a bit more subtle. It's a bit more mellow, a bit more relaxed. It really, um, when I share this with my friends, I often call it uh, like a mixture between gin and whiskey. It's definitely got a lot more refinement to it, a bit more of a grainy touch. Now, don't get me wrong. Many brands of Yeneva have a huge botanical presence, either in their nose or taste or both, but uh, they're different. I, I wouldn't put them into the same category. The first mentions of Yeneva date back to the early 13th century when several Belgian authors described the process of adding berries and branches of the juniper tree to wine before distilling it to create a strong beverage for medicinal use. And that is not very shocking because juniper has a long, long history of being a medicinal, a medicinal herb. That's probably not the right word. Botanicals. But uh, it has been commonly used in different medicines and remedies and cures across Central Europe, up into Scandinavia, even reaching further south into parts of the Middle East and Northern Africa. But just like juniper, hard liquor has also been commonly used as a medicine throughout history since the, the uh, invention of distillation. So it really makes sense that those two would come together to create the perfect medicine. Wine-based Yeneva was the standard. It was the most commonly available option until around the 1500s when uh, distillers started utilizing malt wines or distiller's beers, uh, strong concoctions made from malt, barley, rye, and they would distill that into a very neutral grain-based spirit, in which point they would infuse it with the botanicals, particularly the juniper tree. And by the 1600s, uh, wine-based Yeneva wasn't very common anymore. In fact, the malt-based Yeneva became the staple. And it's that malty base, that, that, that base spirit that really provides a lot of the uh, refinement as it's aged and gives it that more whiskey-esque touch. Yeneva became insanely popular. By the 1600s, it was no longer even really medicinal. It was just the strong drink of the Dutch. Uh, it became the most commonly drank liquor within the Dutch kingdom. With that said, production processes did change around the World War time frame, World War I and World War II, that is. Grain shortages became kind of commonplace and distillers had to look for easier, more efficient sugar sources. So a lot of Yeneva started being produced from molasses, from beet sugars, potatoes even. And that created a very uh, strong, very cheap, very easy to produce base spirit. And uh, when the malt production kind of came back into play, there was two distinct different types of Yeneva available on the market. We had the 
Oud Unaver, which was the original malt-based interpretation, and then there was Jung Unaver, which was that new, cheaper sugar production. Many people think the differences between Oud and Jung is the maturation process or aging it in barrels or whatever, but really what it comes down to is which era of production processes do you want to follow? Anyways, getting back into the golden era of the Dutch Empire, Yenever would thrive. It would become uh, insanely popular, and uh, it was, like I said, the staple drink of the Dutch. Uh, they would export it to different lands, but it primarily had its, uh, its main support, its hub, in the lowland countries. It wasn't until the 1660s when the Dutch-Portuguese War began and bring English soldiers to the mainland Europe where they gained a fascination with the spirit. The English were greatly impressed with both the flavor and the strength of Yenever, uh, greatly outdoing many of the offerings and strong spirits they had back at home. Additionally, they really enjoyed how fierce the Dutch soldiers were in combat after having a couple <laughs> rounds of Yenever. Uh, that actually led to the coinage of the term Dutch courage. As the war concluded and the English went back to their homelands, they took with them their love and their passion and probably a healthy stockpile of Yenever, where it became insanely popular amongst the British Isles. Yenever was so popular that eventually King William III forced the halt of its importation, removed taxation restrictions on English-produced distilled beverages, all in the attempt to establish a homegrown distilling industry as lucrative as the Dutch and their Yenever producers. According to legend, the Yenevers that the English made did not live up to flavor or strength of the Dutch. So what they ended up doing was adding way more sugars to it, way more botanicals, way more juniper. And the, the constant changing of the recipe and uh, adulterations and adaptations eventually led to something that was akin to Yenever, but not quite Yenever. Thus... Gin was born. The popularity of Yenever would rise and fall over the centuries, uh, coming very, very close to actual extinction uh, several times, predominantly, as I mentioned, after those world wars where the production processes had to change, but also there was a lot of like weird legal combat <laughs> against politicians and Yenever producers and drinkers. It's, it's chaotic and uh, it happened way too frequently, but somehow Yenever was able to survive through uh, innovative thinking and uh, the constant adaptation of the distillers to the current environment. Luckily for us, Yenever has survived into the modern era and it has uh, become, uh, once again, it, it has remained is the better way to say it, the staple cultural drink of the Dutch. And it has also started getting a little popularity in your niche, you know, spirit and liquor drinking communities and has even had a minor, very minor hipster <laughs> uh, emergence in the US as uh, people flock to new and interesting spirits. It's even become kind of uh, infused in the American cocktail revival. Uh, there's a great podcast called Neat, the Booze Cast, which kind of covers some of the different cocktails as well as uh, some of the finer historical points that we don't have time for here in this video. Check it out. Needless to say, Yenever has become a staple of the Dutch drinking culture. And speaking of drinking culture, like any great spirit, it has a ritual that goes <laughs> that circles around it that makes the overall Yenever drinking experience that much more fun. If you end up in a bar that serves your neighbor, particularly in the Netherlands, but also parts of France, Belgium, parts of Germany even, and I've even seen some emergence down in Switzerland, you might come across something known as the headbutt, or the koopstutje in Dutch. The koopstutje is a little bit of a drinking ritual. It is a, a dance almost, in which you will take a beer, typically a pale lager, uh, a Dutch brand if you have it, Heineken, for example. You will then fill your Yenever glass all the way up to the top. You actually want to have a little bit of a bubble on the surface, That's that nice surface tension. One of the articles I came across said that the reason you want that, that the surface tension bubble on top of the glass is that way the drinker is ensured that they are getting the full glass worth and they're getting what they paid for. Some weird stereotype play going on in there, but. The Yenever snifter is then set behind the glass of beer 
and the drinker will put their hands behind their back, leaning over the beer. and slurping off the top before taking their beer. I wish I did not choose such a tall glass for that. That was <laughs> way more challenging than it should have been. But it's that that leaning forward, that headbutt to the glass where the Coupe Stuccia gets its name from, the headbutt. I'm doing this Coupe Stuccia with a Oud Yenever, but that is because that's all I have on hand. Typically, this is done with your younger ones in order to uh, not really wash out the more refined aspects uh, of the Oud Yenever, which is oftentimes held in a higher regard. And as I mentioned, the Coupe Stuccia is usually done with a typical easygoing light beer like a Pilsner. However, in the modern era, there has been a lot of push for experimentation with craft beers. I particularly enjoy an Oud Yeneva with an IPA. The flavor pairings go incredibly well. You can also try it with a stout because the botanical nature of it and the more whiskey type element of it plays incredibly well with the darker notes of a nice sweet stout. But honestly, the sky is the limit and whatever you're willing to experiment with and try out, I'm sure you'll be able to find some great combinations and pairings. Unfortunately, the history of the Coupe Stuja is largely lost to time. It is a very, very old tradition, probably dating all the way back to the time where somebody first learned that they're able to drink a beer and a shot of liquor at the same time. With that said, I have also seen plenty of articles talking about taking a shot of your neighbor, slamming it into your beer, and that would make it a submarine or the Dutch submarine, however you want to call it. Now, the Coupe Stuja has been adopted for the modern era. Uh, what I've seen some people call the Coupe Stuja 2.0, which is the craft beer and uh, Yenever pairings. I have also seen craft beer kind of take the concept on its own, brewing rather strong beers infused with different botanicals that you would typically find in a Yenever and calling them the Coupe Stuja beers. In Seattle in particular, there's one that's brewed with a beer de garde, a nice strong malty beer infused with all the different botanicals. Uh, it, I, I haven't tried it myself, but all the reviews I've seen are rather impressive. In conclusion, Yenever is such a interesting and fascinating beverage. Uh, I do think it is criminally underrated, criminally underappreciated, but once you actually take a sip of it, I think you would see what all the magic is. It's a perfect gateway between gin drinkers who want to get into whiskey or whiskey drinkers who want to get into gin. It's the best of both worlds. It's the big botanical flavor, but it's also the refined, more uh, highly regarded, highly appreciated malt-based spirit, you know? And when you find the ones that are more complex, more crafty, or aged in those different barrels, uh, the, the world's your oyster. There's so many different ways to enjoy Yenever. And as I mentioned earlier, I do think it is criminal to degrade it and just call it Dutch gin because it's so much more than that. Again, it's older. It's the OG, the original. But if you've never had Yenever, I uh, strongly, encourage you go chase it down seek it out because it's a fun and adventurous world of spirits that is also incredibly old it's it's historical but it's also primed for this modern era of like craft cocktails and uh, finer enjoyment of spirits and if you're just a beer lover you know you don't want to stray too far into the world of distillation at least try the Coupe Stuja because <laughs> it's fun, especially when you've had several in a row. Things start getting a little out of hand and you might actually end up headbutting your glass. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something about this awesome spirit and this awesome drinking culture surrounding it and a little bit about the beer and shot history. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. Remember, there is a story in every bottle and that life is brutal. Cheers.